Could e-bike packing become a thing? So as we've seen over the last five or so years, e-bikes have really gained a solid footing in the bike marketplace and really have attracted many new riders. But can they become a mode of transport for a bike packing trip? In this video, I delve into several details in hopes of finding an answer to that very question. Let's do it. Just last week, Salsa Cycles launched its new range of e-bikes, and it got all of us thinking about how this fits into the adventure cycling world. After all, Salsa has dedicated its brand to bikepacking bikes and adventure by bike for well over a decade. So while Salsa's release of these new models may have been the impetus to creating this video, plenty of other brands have already developed e-bikes with similar intent. We will get into that at the end of this video, but just by searching adventure e-bikes in Google, you'll find yourself in a strikingly unfamiliar world. That reminded me of how out of the loop I and the rest of the bikepacking.com team are when it comes to e-bikes. This isn't something that we did on purpose exactly, but we have always and will continue to put human-powered travel at the forefront of what we do. But to better understand if e-bike packing is even possible and what its future might look like, we need to discuss a few things, regardless of whether all of us are on board with the idea or not. All right, so before we get any further, I just wanna take a quick break and let you all know that this video is supported in part by Old Man Mountain. Rather than trying to clamp to round or tapered forks, just hoping that your cages don't slip or spin, the Old Man Mountain axle pack makes it impossible to move. Have a carbon fork without mounts? That'll work. A suspension fork? Perfect. An older aluminum bike? They've got it covered. If you have a through axle fork, you can use their fit kits to mount their axle packs. So to learn a little bit more about their newly launched product, hit the card in the top right corner, or you could also follow the link in the description below. First, we need to understand the different types of e-bikes and how they're classified, which varies by country. So here in the United States, there are three main classes. Class one, which provides pedal assist up to 20 miles per hour. Class two offers throttle assist alongside pedal assist up to 20 miles per hour. And class three, which extends pedal assist up to 28 miles an hour. Simply put, classes one and three require pedaling, while all you need to do for class two is press a throttle and go. So in Canada, motors are limited to 500 watt output and can't travel faster than 32 kilometers or 20 miles per hour on motor power alone on level ground. And in Europe, for the most part, e-bikes are typically limited to 25 kilometers or 15.5 miles per hour with pedal assist only, no throttle. Going faster than that makes it a speed pedalic requiring registration and plates. Motors are capped at 250 watts with some exceptions like boost modes. However, the UK may actually soon raise that limit to 500 watts. So compared to the US, European e-bikes are slower and less powerful, but much more widely accepted and can be ridden almost anywhere without much controversy. But we'll talk about more of that later. So e-bikes also differ based on the bike's electric motor location. You will see basically two main types of e-bikes. Mid-drive, where the motor is located and built into the bottom bracket, and hub drive, where the motor is in the rear or sometimes front hub. The lightweight and compact design of the hub drive gives bicycle manufacturers a little bit more freedom. As you can see here with the Salsa Cycles Confluence, which makes the bike look much more conventional. But generally, hub drive e-bikes are not nearly as powerful as mid drives. All right, so each one of these bikes also comes with one of many drive brands. For example, there are a lot of mid drive motors out there such as Bosch, SRAM, Shimano, and many others. It's also worth mentioning that there are also aftermarket kits available to turn existing bikes into e-bikes and back into non-assisted bikes. Again, Cass has actually successfully done this using uh, the Bafang mid-drive motor on a Jones. All right, so the most significant variable among e-bikes is the battery. Yeah, the thing that really makes it go, which dictates ride time and distance and recharging logistics. This is where things start to get complex. And if you value the freedom of simply riding your bike and camping wherever you want, well, a battery powered bike 
just might not be for you. Things that affect the battery range are weather, rider and rig weight, terrain, throttle usage, cadence, and riding speed. But to get a little bit of a better idea what to expect, you need to kind of understand the battery and drive system that you are using. So since Salsa uses the Bosch motor system, we will plug the tributary specs into the Bosch range calculator using conditions that I often find myself in. So I would say I'm around 190-ish pounds with a loaded bike. The tributary has a performance line mid-drive system and a power tube 625 battery. It appears that we are on a upright road bike. That's kind of what the tributary looks like with cross-country tires. And I'll plug in conditions I find in my backyard here in Colorado during the summer. I guess I'd probably be going about 12 miles an hour on the e-bike. And for kicks, I just set the auto riding mode on. So with all of that, Bosch says that I would like get around 34 miles before the battery dies and when I add the range extender that gives me almost 50 miles. Now I know this is a case of a lot depends but it should give you a good idea. You certainly could get more range in eco mode in perfect conditions on flat terrain or much less in turbo mode in less than ideal riding conditions. Colder temperatures will certainly reduce that runtime. We could really get into the weeds about this a bit more, but simply put, no ride or e-bike is the same. So a lot really depends on the specific battery and motor, the way you ride, and the conditions you ride it on. This might be a reason why some manufacturers simply don't even share the max range of a certain bike. All right, so recharging is another factor that might make you rethink a trip as you'll need a way to recharge your batteries to continue moving with assistance. You can still pedal an e-bike without using the motor, but bear in mind that some motors exhibit significant drag and with the added weight, it is much more challenging without the assistance of the motor's power. This means that you must bring a charger. Some work faster than others and some are larger than others. My Bosch 4A charger comes in at just under 800 grams and is the size of a water bottle. That is not light or small. But once you get a good feel for your battery range, you can better understand how far you can go between stops. While I sometimes find myself in hotels on trips, 90% of the time I camp in the woods or under the stars, which is what I strongly prefer while bikepacking, and I know I'm not alone there. E-bike packing certainly opens a different style of travel, one where you might consider riding from lodge to lodge or hotel to hotel, or even to a more developed campground that has outlets to recharge your battery each night. So depending on the battery drain capacity, and charge time, this could take up to a whole night with some of the largest batteries available. And while there are chargers to charge batteries rapidly, it is best for the battery's lifespan or health to slow charge them. All right, so obviously the more weight you have, the more energy your e-bike will use to carry you forward. When we think about adding, I don't know, upwards to 30 pounds of bike packing gear, that's a significant amount and will certainly take up a little bit more battery life. I'm sure there's a more precise or scientific way of calculating this, but again, this is more of an introductory video for us and you, so I won't dive into that too much today. In the United States, regulations regarding e-bikes vary by state and locality. Generally, e-bikes are allowed on roads and streets where traditional bicycles are permitted. However, access to bike paths, trails, and other recreational areas may depend on the classification of the e-bike. So here in the United States, class one and two e-bikes are typically permitted on most trails and paths, but restrictions may apply in particular areas. All right, so an excellent example of this is locally here in the Gunnison National Forest in my backyard, where e-bikes are allowed on motorized trails where dirt bikes are permitted, but off limits to non-motorized trails. That said, it might not be as clear or cut and dry in other areas. Class three e-bikes with their higher speeds may face more stringent regulations depending on your location, such as Colorado here, where class three e-bikes actually aren't allowed on bike paths due to the faster speeds that they can travel. What has to be considered now for a bike packing route to be e-bike friendly? This certainly will require some homework, but as I mentioned, if you wanted to ride, say, the Great Divide mountain bike route, the bike pass section uh, in Colorado from Silverthorne to Breckenridge is off limits to class three e-bikes, such as 
the Salsa tributary. So you would need to ride with traffic through that section. However, class one e-bikes such as the Salsa Confluence can ride that path. You must also find supplemental charging as many stretches on bikepacking routes are 100 plus miles between resupply. All right, so in Europe, as I mentioned, e-bikes are much less controversial. In fact, many places have already built infrastructure around them. Uh, many places in the mountains there, like the Dolomites, are completely set up for e-bikes with charging ports in huts and public charging zones in some places too, which you can integrate into your bikepacking trip. That sounds actually a lot of fun. That all said, e-bikes work really well in Europe because the distances between, uh, say, resupply points or those chargers is often shorter. This all means it might be difficult to plan a trip on an already established route without doing some pretty serious planning here in the United States. I would think the upside here is that you can likely lower your overall travel time as e-bikes are certainly more efficient and faster from A to B. That approach might also allow a bit more downtime where you can charge your bike or take a more extended lunch break in a town and get back on the bike to your next outlet. Finally, e-bikes also require more maintenance. Not only are there more moving parts, but limited lifespan parts like chains, brake pads will certainly wear out faster. So if you're on the move, uh, say on an extended trip, you might need to pay a little bit more attention to that. All of that said, one really cool benefit of an e-bike is using it as a tool to enable bikepacking routes. Think scouting routes or trying to find out if a road goes through. I could see where folks could use an e-bike for this reason and a slew of others, such as helping get folks on bikes who really otherwise couldn't or perhaps getting out on a trail workday without access via road, or using cargo bikes that replace vehicles. As a commuter, I've been using a Surly Big Easy for the better part of three years. In the summers, it truly replaces a vehicle, picking up groceries, doing chores around town, dropping off uh, packages at the post office, and picking up our kiddo from daycare. It really is a game changer. But e-cargo bikes can also double as family e-bike packing rigs or for dog hauling as Cass has demonstrated here. This also means that you may not need to go and drive out to a trailhead, but rather just pedal out of town on your e-bike with ease before getting into the good stuff. Not only is it more rewarding riding from your front door, but you don't have to worry about parking your car and leaving it uh, at a trailhead overnight. So whether you're on a cargo bike or using your regular e-bike for around town commuting or errands, these things are really extremely useful. All right, so this all begs the question, is there a good e-bike for bikepacking? And if so, what kind? Obviously, like any subgenre of bikepacking, it really depends on the type of riding you plan on doing. But there aren't many options optimized for bikepacking just yet. And when I say this, I mean performance-based bikes with big volume tire clearance, stable geometry, and yeah, extra long battery life. The new Salsa Tributary seems like a good option for a quick overnighter out of town, or if you can plan a trip around recharging every 30 to 50 miles, sometimes more if you're on flat terrain. Uh, the bike clears 2.6 inch rubber and generally looks like a nice capable uh, bike for dirt road excursions and comes with plenty of mounts. Another really intriguing option is the Specialized Creo 2 Comp, which has 2.2 inch tire clearance and a claimed 120 mile range in ideal riding conditions and bike settings, but much less from the research that I've done in suboptimal conditions, or let's say my ideal conditions. There are a number of other e-bikes in the gravel category, such as the Niner RLTE RDO that comes with 500 watt hour battery. The Kona Libre EL is another option that is a little bit lighter than many other drop bar e-bikes. It is a class one e-bike with a 500 watt hour Shimano battery. The Cannondale Topstone Neo is another option that springs to mind. Then there are hardtails, which actually offer some of probably the best geometry for mixed terrain bikepacking routes. But if you're riding more steep technical climbs, the battery life tends to be much shorter. A few options that look promising include the Orbea Arun, Kona Remote, or the Trek Powerfly 4, but 
The market is so saturated, especially with the e-bike specific brands. Uh, and if it were me, I would definitely stick with a brand that has history of putting together developing acoustic bikes. That's just me though. All right, so in my opinion, all the bikes I just mentioned simply don't quite cut the mustard. Ideally, there would be a bike that has an average range of 50 miles in hilly or mountainous terrain. I know that puts a lot of pressure on the battery, but that's what I think would be the baseline before I take one out on an e-bike packing trip. If I did plan a trip with an e-bike, I would need to rethink my goals and how I conceptualize bike packing. On my normal trips, I don't always find myself in towns every day. I really do appreciate the infrastructure being built and developed in Europe, but similar opportunities don't seem to be fully fleshed out in other parts of the world, especially here in the United States. I also don't foresee the industry making more dedicated e-bike packing bikes just yet, but I do see improved run times being a priority. So maybe we will see something more apt for bike packing down the road. So what do you all think about the future of e-bike packing? Have you ever done it or would you? What else am I missing? We're really just at the beginning of this conversation and I invite you to let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And if you like what you saw in this video and want to see more like it, please hit that subscribe button and notification bell. And if you want to help support us a little bit more, you can do so by signing up for the Bikepacking Collective. The Bikepacking Collective offers a lot of awesome perks, including the twice yearly Bikepacking Journal. So to learn a little bit more about the Bikepacking Collective, hit the card in the top right corner, or else follow the link in the description below. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, Pedal further.